welcome to EZLM Learning Simplified. My name is Ruth and today we are going to be discussing on the topic acid base and salts um, and we are going to be looking at qualitative analysis today and this is going to form the first part of the session. So we are going to look at the basis of qualitative analysis and in our next session you are going to have like a review of uh, the whole qualitative or part of paper three. So today we are going to focus on our testing of cations, and then the next lesson we look at testing of anions. So salts contain cations and anions. So cations are the positively charged ions, and anions are the negatively charged ions. And when they are dissolved in water, which is polar. A cation and an ion in a salt is determined usually by precipitation of the salt using a precipitating agent. So we're able to determine what kind of cation of an, or an anion in our solution if we use an agent that can help precipitate out. So these agents are different. The color of the precipitate is the basis of qualitative analysis of a compound. So quantitative analysis is the process of identifying a known compound or a sort by identifying unique qualities of a sort or compound. Uh, so you'll notice when we are looking for these unique properties of a compound, sometimes we do different tests and these tests help us to understand what compound we are identifying. So you notice you're going to be maybe heating in qualitative analysis. So you test the gases being produced. Um, then maybe we can test also if there is any heat or absorbed or given out. There is also color change. Color change is one of the most common way of identifying compounds. And then there's also formation of precipitates. This precipitate can be also colored or not colored and then also production of an order in regards to other compounds. So qualitative analysis involve identifying now these qualities of that specific salt or compound. So we will start first by remembering the solubility of salts, which is form two. It will help us to understand some of these concepts in regards to qualitative analysis. So remember we said all sorts of potassium, sodium, and ammonium are soluble. All nitrates are also soluble. All chlorides are soluble with exception of silver, mercury, and lead. And lead 2 chloride is soluble in hot water. And remember these uh, differences, these exceptions, are the ones that are very common even in qualitative analysis. So it is important to remember these exceptions. So especially lead 2 chloride is tested a lot in qualitative analysis. So remember the lead 2 chloride is soluble in hot water, but it is insoluble in cold water. And all sulfates are soluble except <clears throat> calcium, barium, and lead sulfate. Uh, and then all carbonates are insoluble except sodium, potassium, and ammonium carbonate. Of course, we said these ones are all their salts are soluble. And all hydroxides are insoluble as well, except sodium, potassium, and ammonium. And calcium hydroxides are sparingly soluble. You notice this exception on calcium also helps it to behave in a certain way, also with bases. So you start with the analysis of or identifying cations in regards to their reaction with sodium hydroxide. So you're going to look at each cation that is possible there and how they react with sodium hydroxide so that it can help us to form the theoretical basis of qualitative analysis. So both sodium and potassium hydroxide are usually precipitating reagents. We say that precipitating reagents are the ones that help us to precipitate out the specific source so that we can be able to identify that cation or an ion. So sodium and potassium hydroxide are used, although potassium hydroxide is a bit expensive and more reactive, so sodium hydroxide is mostly used. 
So the alkalis produce unique color of a precipitate when a few drops are added and the excess ad alkali is added to the compound solution. So we said, as I said earlier, potassium hydroxide is not that compound because it's very expensive. So what you're going to do, the experiment is testing the presence of these cations. So you take solutions containing these cations and these solutions are soluble. If you note, like the solutions we are using for this procedure, all of them are soluble. So we have magnesium fluoride, calcium fluoride, aluminium fluoride, sodium chloride, potassium, iron 2 sulfate, iron 3 sulfate, copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, ammonium nitrate, lead nitrate, barium nitrate, and we put them in separate test tube. We add a few drops of sodium hydroxide and then we add to excess. So that's how this experiment works. So you notice that these are some of the inferences. So first of all, for sodium and potassium, they usually form no precipitate. So if there is no precipitate, it means there is won't be any precipitate even in excess. So sodium reacts with hydroxide ions, not the ionic equation to, some, to form sodium hydroxide, which is soluble as we said in the solubility rules. So you can see where the solubility rules come in. And then the ammonium ions are still the same. There is no precipitate um, that is like given off, but you know that ammonium ions, ammonia itself has a pungent smell. So you hear that, you, 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 you smell that smell. So it also forms ammonia uh, gas plus water. But now when we come now to other cations, so barium, calcium, and magnesium, when they react with hydroxide ions in sodium, they form white precipitate, white precipitate. And these white precipitates are insoluble. So you see, you, you have to remember this theoretical property of barium, calcium, and magnesium ions. And then we have some unique ones, that is the zinc ions, lead ions, aluminium ions, also commonly known as ZAP. It's, it's easier to remember it that way. So when these uh, few drops of sodium hydroxide are added into their solution, they usually form white precipitates. But if more sodium hydroxide is added, those white precipitates dissolve to form colorless solution. So remember before we came to this session, you were talking about different types of oxides and hydroxides. And we said there is a group of hydroxides and oxides called um, amphoteric oxides and hydroxides. So actually zinc, lead, and aluminum are amphoteric in nature. So they can be able to react with acids and they can be able to react with bases. That is the reason why when you add a few drops and forms a white precipitate, if you continue adding, it actually reacts with the hydroxide ions further to form a colorless solution. And that is where the complexes come in. In some situation, theoretically, you can be asked to write the formula of the, of the complex, but it is the same complex that we discussed when we were discussing uh, amphoteric oxides and hydroxides. So you can see it's forming tetrahydroxos, two ion, tetrahydroxolate, two ion, and tetrahydroxoaluminium ion. So these are the, base, the, the, the unique ones when it comes to tests with sodium hydroxide. So also we have others, and you notice I separated them depending on the kind of color they form. So for the previous ones, they were forming either a white precipitate or no white precipitate. But for these ones are unique because they form colored precipitates. And these ones, you need to remember them in the case where they are like you get that specific precipitate in your analysis so when you add a few drops in copper ions you notice it's going to form a blue precipitate and even if you add excess the blue precipitate is going to remain of copper hydroxide for iron to iron it forms a green precipitate remember the difference between iron 2 and iron 3 iron 3 forms a brown precipitate as you can see so iron 2 ions react with hydroxide ions to form iron, iron 2 hydroxide and then iron 3 hydroxide as well, which is brown. So you notice these are the colored ones and they also form precipitate, which are insoluble in excess.
next we are going to look at the test now with ammonia so so we said that one of the precipitating reagents is sodium hydroxide another precipitating reagent is actually ammonia so we're going to repeat the same process so uh, the same cations or the same solutions we place them in a test tube and then we added a few drops of ammonia and then we noted the colors or any change and then we added excess ammonia so these are the observations that you're going to notice same way i'm going to i have divided them in their categories starting with the the ones that are not colored to the ones that are colored so you make sure you note also the uniqueness so first of all if you add uh, a few drops of ammonia in sodium and potassium ions they're not going to form any precipitates remember these ones are soluble salts and even in excess it doesn't so it forms hydroxide same case with ammonium ions I should put this on here and then we go to barium remember we grouped barium calcium and magnesium previously together but you can see we have added aluminium and lead so you can see there is a, a difference between testing with sodium hydroxide and testing with ammonia so barium ions calcium ions magnesium ions lead ions and aluminium ions if you add a few drops of ammonia they will form white precipitate not the color and if you continue adding more the white precipitate remains so it is insoluble in excess but we have two unique uh, uh, solutions that is zinc ions and copper ions so first of all zinc ions forming one of the ones that are not colored if you add a few drops of ammonia it forms a white precipitate but this precipitate now if you add excess it dissolves what happens is because zinc reacts further with ammonia a uh, solution to form a complex this complex is here it's called tetraamine zinc 2 ion so note how it's written it's tetraamine because there are four amine uh, ions and then amine as in ammonia that's how it's referred to in complexes and then you can zinc and two iron so copper behaves in the same manner but the only difference between copper and zinc is that copper is colored so when copper ions when you add a few drops of ammonia in copper ions they form a blue precipitate if you add excess the precipitate actually dissolves but it dissolves to form uh, a deep blue solution so you notice most of the copper compounds are usually colored so that is the reason why also it forms a deep blue solution so it also forms a complex called tetraamine copper 2 ion it's a deep blue solution and this is the formula in some theoretical analysis you might be asked to write the complex name so we have this flow chart here we can go through it uh, slowly and see how to analyze you're not going to look at the questions but we are going to just do a theoretical analysis so you have a mixture m that you add water and then filter so when you add water and filter it tells you that it's a mixture and one of the substances is soluble the other one is insoluble so we have a presence of a polar and a non-polar compound so we have now solution n a solid n sorry and solution p so solid n tells you it's the non-polar one because it didn't dissolve in the water and then solution p tells you it's the polar because it's left as a filtrate so for solid n when you heat it it forms a black solid cube and a gas which forms a white precipitate when bubbled through calcium hydroxide so this gas tells you it's carbon four oxide so this tells you that the solid we are working here is a carbonate so then black solid q you react it with sulfuric acid you form blue solution s there is only one blue solution in chemistry and that is copper ion solution so that is copper sulfate and this tells you the black solid now was copper oxide and then this copper sulfate was added to aqueous ammonia excess aqueous ammonia so the deep blue solution is actually tetraamine copper 2 ion
And then if you react uh, copper sulfate with magnesium powder, there is a displacement uh, since magnesium is more reactive than copper. So it displaces um, copper ions to form copper solid and magnesium sulfate. Next, we come to solution P. Solution P, if you add acidified barium nitrate, you'll come to this in the next session. Acidified barium nitrate, of course, you mentioned it when you were looking at tests for nitrates and sulfates. You noticed if you add acidified barium nitrate and filter, it tells you that you're going to form either a precipitate or no precipitate. So that if you add a few drops of barium uh, nitrate and a precipitate is formed, which is followed by an acid, it tells you there's the presence of sulfate ions. So when a white solid is formed, it tells you like we had some sulfate ions. If there is a colorless solution formed, remember the barium ions are the ones that react with the sulfate ions to form barium sulfate. The other ions that were in solutions which you do not know now react with the nitrate ions to form now the colorless solution. Remember it's like it's a, a precipitation reaction where we, like when we were forming the insoluble salts. So the barium ions interchanges cations with the X ions. So barium takes the sulfate ion, that's why when it's, you add the acidified barium it doesn't dissolve fully, it tells you it forms a white precipitate, which tells you that this substance is a sulfate ions. And then the nitrate ions react with the other metal cation that we don't know to form the colorless solution. So when you add excess ammonia, the white precipitate dissolves to form a clear solution. And we know the only one that behaves that way is zinc ions. So this tells you X will be our zinc ion. So this tells you solution P is zinc night sulfate. Zinc sulfate because the sulfate ions reacted with barium and then it took the nitrate ions. So our mixture now, it means is our mixture is made up of copper, carbonate, and zinc sulfate. So this is an example of the theoretical analysis that can come. Also, we have the practical analysis that you're going to look at later. So that brings us to the end. Next, you're going to look at the remaining part of qualitative analysis and we close off. See you then.